Sorry, my hands are sweaty again. Hey, folks, we're uh, we're just hanging out. We'll be we'll be getting started in a couple minutes. So, so I was just at the Ace Hardware show, and uh, they had this Flex Seal booth. Okay, so I need to silence. I'm trying to get it to. I'm just gonna kill the audio on that page. And and so the, the Flex Seal folks, all they were doing was looping the Jerry Seinfeld bit on Flex Seal when he was on Jimmy Kimmel the other day. <laughs> and it was great. It was the best thing. And he's talking about these late night Flex Seal ads. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was it was like, yes. Um the, the hit the Seinfeld bit is he's saying, I just wish that I had something that was broken that I could use. Oh uh, says I'm living my life in hopes and, and <laughs> dreams hopes that something, something will start leaking so I can get on board. Because these flex seal people just seem like they're having so much fun. I need to test this out for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Here, this is the this is the, oh, yeah. the flex seal booth. <laughs> Pretty intense. Um, yeah. <laughs> Did you see anything like what was like the weirdest? I guess. Like, uh, I mean, from... there, there, there's like the, they have the whole seasonal section, so oh. there's all the Christmas stuff. So it's what it's March, and there's just aisles and aisles of Christmas crap that nobody wants. <laughs> um, so that was that was exciting. Uh, what else? I mean, there was a lady with a like showing off chainsaws, and she was doing a doing a wood carving. That was pretty oh, nice. cool. Um, yeah, it's just everything that you could possibly imagine that. So like most Ace Hardware stores are similar, but they're pretty unique. I guess like if you, if owners can choose like what they want to buy in the store, there's probably I don't know a little yeah, bit. Yeah, everything. I talked. Different. So there were people repping Jack Link's jerky, and uh -oh. so I was like, "Tell me about the jerky business." And it turns out it's very competitive. <laughs> <laughs> so they're talking about how hard it is to get you know a slot in the store, and uh, and how hard yeah. they work to get their displays, and then how they'll send a Jack Link's display to a hardware store and then they'll buy somebody else's jerky and they'll put it on the Jack Link's display. Oh, no. and then they have... <laughs> so it's Please. just a whole world that you don't think about. <laughs> so somebody said video quality is kind of funky. Mm. How's the video quality looking for everybody else? It looks pretty good for us here. Uh, and I'd love to know where everybody who's on the, the stream, where are yeah. you from? How's the video look where you're from? Tell us and, uh, and we'll give you a shout out. I was surprised how many people just from all over the world came to the uh, our live teardown of the S9. Of the S9, S9 Plus. Yeah, that was a that great. Was really cool. Yeah. I was I was just hoping for so, some kind of new interesting hardware design from Samsung on the S9. It's like it's Here. the same as the S8, which is the same as the S7, which is the same as the the Note 7, which and is I bumped up the camera and that's what a lot of people you know, like to look for, but I don't know if that's worthy of the upgrade. <laughs> but we got folks on here from India, Sweden. Illinois, Sweden, Boston. Awesome. I don't see anybody from Macedonia. California yet. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Canada. Awesome. We, well, well, we'll, uh, we'll keep the discussion broad then yeah. so that we can talk about other stuff. Yeah. Um, and definitely ask questions as we're um, chatting here. Once we get Chicago, New Orleans, Rialto. All right. Finally, we got somebody from California, yeah. uh, Bulgaria. Okay. I was the only Frenchie at the iFixit Pro unconference. There nice. you go. Hi, Carl. <laughs> Wait, Carl's on? Carl's on. Oh, I miss Carl. <laughs> Carl, come hang out with us again. <laughs> New York. Prince Amir. There we go. Said your name. <laughs> San Diego, Compton. Nice. And Tel cool. Aviv. Holy cow, cool. I well, guess so. We got more people from Sweden than California. We'll get there. <laughs> We can talk about Sweden needs to do Sweden needs to get on board with this. Uh, Sweden uh, has passed pro repair legislation, but Thanks. not right to repair yet. All right. Well, it's two o'clock. Let's get going. Get started. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, my name is Kelsey, and this is Kyle, CEO, co-founder or co-founder of iFixit, and then we also have uh, Matt Zeminski from Pulse on with thanks. us today. And uh, we're today we're just talking about right to repair legislation. Uh, right to repair is being introduced in California, and it's the 18th state this year, up from 12 last year. And uh, if passed, uh, manufacturers will be required to offer replacement parts um, and repair um, manuals and information to um, th both you know, you know, private fixers like us and to um, private repair shops. So, um, but yeah, but this isn't anything new, right? So going back, all the way back to 2012, um, right. 
yeah. It's- yeah. So right to repair has, I mean, this is something we've had legislation on the books for right, for right to repair around cars for a long time. The most recent one was in Massachusetts in 2012. And it said, Hey, make sure that local mechanics can get what they need to fix their, you know, any car. So you yeah. can go to a local mechanic with a GM, you can go with a BMW and, and you're going to be able to get it fixed. Yeah. Cause I know if I was kind of forced into going to the dealership for everything that that would that'd be pretty frustrating. So it's kind of opened up this, you know, it's made it easier for, all of us to get our cars fixed and created um, an aftermarket for um, parts for autos. Right. And that's you know, right. something that could happen. Yeah. You can go into a mechanic and you need a new bumper for your car and they'll say, well, do you want the OEM bumper? It's this price. Or do yeah. you want the aftermarket bumper? It's a little bit less. And you can choose and you can say, no, actually I really care about having the OEM part. Yeah. But right now in, in a lot of uh, electronics, uh, there's no way to get an OEM part. Yeah. Mm, that's tough. And so, so it's interesting if you go back to how how did right to repair get happen in Massachusetts? What was the process like? Yeah. This idea that we can pass a law is really daunting and challenging. It turned out it, it just it took um, some of the mechanic groups getting together, getting organized, and then getting mm-hmm. getting their friends. Um, they, they put together a network of folks in in Massachusetts that cared about the issue, and they went to the legislature and got a couple of legislators to say, "Yeah, we think it's a good idea." And then you start building momentum, and you get more and more legislators on board. And so we've been involved um, since 2011. And did we? So when did um, Repair.org, I guess, become the big you know movement and push behind it? Have, has it been since 2011? Or uh, we? I think when did we start, Matt? Maybe it was like 2014, 2015. Yeah. Yeah. But now, you know, we work with Repair.org to keep, get legislation, you know, introduced into states. And we're working with Gay Gordon Byrne. And uh, who are right. some other- Gay is the director yeah. of, of Repair.org. She's the one kind of uh, uh, bringing everybody together. But yeah, Repair.org, really, it's it's a network of people that are interested in the issue. It's, it's repair businesses. It's uh, tool wholesalers. It's, you know, companies that, that provide uh, managed repair services for companies. It's a pretty broad network. It's- Concerned consumers, right? Uh, yeah. And 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 so there has been a history. I mean, we've had a number of states introduce bills. Nobody has passed it yet yeah. for electronics, but there's there's a lot of momentum. People are are working on it. We've had uh, a number of hearings so far this year. Uh, so Washington State introduced legislation mm-hmm. for the first time, and they had a they had a hearing in their environment committee a couple months ago. And uh, very smart and legislators that really got it. You know, we had manufacturers saying that well. Uh, people shouldn't be able to tinker with the code on on these <laughs> this equipment. The code is dangerous. And and the legislator said, "Look, I've been working on my car my entire life. How is how is tinkering with software any different than tinkering yeah. with my car?" And I think from the manufacturer's perspective, I mean, they're trying to protect their intellectual property. But like I always say, you can protect your IP and allow people to have access and information. Like the, they're not mutually, I guess, exclusive right. or. Um, so, and, and you can also, you know, hold people accountable for when they do try to copy or steal your IP, but not everybody that's opening it up. An iPhone is trying to make, you know, the Huawei P9 or something that looks like, you know, re- really similar. Right. Um, but, so Matt, what, yeah. Matt runs, uh, uh, runs a lot of the service network at, at Pulse, which has repair technicians around the country. Matt, can you give us your perspective on what, uh, what the problem is? Like, why is this kind of repair uh, legislation needed? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, we've determined and we realize that it's needed just because of the access to repairing common issues that are affecting consumers um, and really how limited the the OEMs really are in their capacity to meet those demands. Uh, you can go back a couple of years ago to issues like Error 53 um, and how, you know, we had software that was limiting the hardware functionality of a device and go back, I think, a year ago or two years ago with the Samsung Galaxy Note 7. Um, and the battery fires. And just in that one example, it, it was really evident that they were not equipped to handle um, an issue of this scale. And independent shops were well positioned to solve that problem. They could meet you where you are, you could take it to your local shop, and they could do the repair probably within, you know, an hour and have you taken out, um, taken that dangerous component out of your phone, and then you're on your way and, and you're good to go. That's the most basic understanding of why this is necessary is there are problems that keep popping up that manufacturers um, will not design around and they just are not equipped to handle when they do pop up. Right. So get board level issues. Uh, right. The, the independents can fix. I mean, I, I, I fixed, uh, we, we have a video on the channel where I fixed a YouTube backlight issue on, 
on an iPhone. A lot of times you use a cheap USB charger and it fries a component yep. on the board. And it can be a five cent part, but you need you need access to schematics in yep. order to be able to do that repair. And right. And even if so, you know, some you know manufacturers might not do you know some of like board level repairs and other repairs like that. But it's also just like a supply issue, like we're seeing with Battery Gate. There's only 500 Apple stores with a few techs in there, but there's millions and millions of people <laughs> that are need a new battery um, or that qualify for that new battery program. So you're right, you know, Matt, like you mentioned, they're just not equipped. We can't just leave it um, up to them or up to John Deere, or whoever else, to tell us, you know, when and how we need to get something fixed because. They just don't have enough people to do it. There's not enough people in the world. And if, you know, if you go to look at the list of Apple stores in the U.S., there are a handful of states that only have one store, like you know, expected in Alaska. But like, um, I think it was New Mexico and Kansas, only one Apple store. And so, uh, yeah, we can't rely on them to um, fix our stuff because there's just too many things breaking. They're <laughs> we're producing way too much, and every single year with upgrades and just with um, the way that we treat our devices and things and the lifespan and the way that they're designed, the lifespan shorter. So, um, yeah. yeah, there's just there's not enough repair techs to go around. And if we could release, you know, this information um, to some of these private repair shops, it also drive down prices too for aftermarket. I mean, I feel like there's almost you know, some of these manufacturers are missing out on the aftermarket parts, like making money in aftermarket parts and selling that kind of right. that stuff. I, I mean, Absolutely. It's a way to diversify their business. I think that the car manufacturers make a lot of money off yeah. of aftermarket service. Like 300 yeah. billion, some billion, it's a billion dollar industry. Right. Uh, yeah. But you have somebody like Apple and Samsung that won't sell batteries to anybody. That's a huge business opportunity. Right. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, too, when you look at the traditional consumer, um, at least in my family, like we're not inclined to go out and buy a new device um, every every cycle. Right. We want to keep what we have lasting longer. Um, and batteries are the simplest example of something that we can replace that keeps something running longer. We do it for our cars like it's nothing. You know, we spend a hundred bucks and get a new battery and throw it in there and it's good to go. We should be able to do that with our electronic devices. And, and further, um, we should be able to do that ourselves so that, you know, we don't have to wait and count on the Apple store that's a couple hours away or the Samsung repair center that's out of my state where I have to mail my device in to get it done. Fantastic. So let's talk a little bit about the legislative process. Like we're all on board. We want to do this. How do you actually uh, get, get, a, get a bill passed? I saw, so Dominic is saying that he is running for state representative in Michigan and right here is a major part of his platform. So that's fantastic. That's exactly what we, Thank we you. need to see. <laughs> so, yeah, Dominic, you're awesome. Uh, let's talk about the process of, of getting a bill uh, passed into law. So this is a bit of a diagram. Uh, uh, excuse the poor graphic design. I stole it from the internet. <laughs> Um, so you get you get you you have an idea. So I go to a, a legislator. I let's say Dominic gets elected, and I'm his constituent. I go to him and say, "We need this right to repair law." He says, "Okay, great. What would it do?" And so that's where we have reference legislation on the Repair.org website, where you can actually give them legal text that this is this is what we'd like to see. And so uh, what what happened in California was we we went to Representative Eggman, uh, who's from Stockton, and we said we, we'd we'd like to have this happen. Can you help us? And and uh, she said sure. And so we worked with her staff, uh, got the bill adapted into into the California law context. Bill has been introduced, and now we're at the point where we're going to be scheduling committee hearings. So the the California bill has been uh, referred to two committees, both the the Natural Resources Committee or the Environment Committee, and 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 that's because of the e waste issue, and then also the Judiciary, where Judiciary is code for laws. <laughs> <laughs> so the Judiciary Committee is kind of the, the all encompassing. A lot of a lot of the bills that go through the legislature go through the Judiciary Committee. So we're going to have a hearing sometime in the next month or so in one of those committees. Uh, and, and that hearing will be in the state capitol, and you can show up and uh, write your name on a sheet of paper. Anybody can show up. It's open to the public and yeah. testify. So when you went up to Washington, we had a bunch of people come out and testify also. Um, what kind of, you know. Yes, this is the state of Washington, not Washington, D.C. The state of Washington introduced a bill, and, and they had a hearing on in their Consumer Protection Committee. And, and so uh, they invited us to come up and, and testify. We had a whole bunch of local repair shops show up and testify. We had uh, some recyclers. We had some folks who do put computers into educational uh, uh, context and they were talking about all of the benefits and then the manufacturers showed up and you had some of these lobbyist organizations like CompTIA and the Consumer Electronics Association and the Equipment Dealers Association. They show up and they they scream and yell about how how this is going to be terrible for the world and how the sky will fall if right to repair passes. So, and I know that they you know talk about protecting their IP and, or, and um, 
liability issues. You know, they don't, they think that they, these um, repairs are too hard for, you know, the average DIYer or even for, you know, pros. Um, what else? I mean, with the liability thing, I mean, they kind of hand over liability when they sell you the device or when, you know, John Deere sells you the tractor. Right. But um, I guess what's the rebuttal to that? Like, I mean, aside from, you know, consumers should be able to choose how and can, you know, they should be able to gauge when a repair is something that's within their skills or not. Cause just cause right. you can repair something, you know, doesn't mean you should, if you don't have the skills, go seek professional help if you can. But most of these repairs can be done on your own. Like we get photos from 10 year olds that, you know, are submitting photos to us every week um, for, uh, there we go, sorry, doing these kinds of repairs. So that's just kind of silly. And I don't know, I kind of take that personally if somebody tells me that, you know, I don't know how to, you know, fix, I, can't, I don't have the skills to swap the battery out on my phone. Right. Um, uh, yeah. And, and this is, this is something that we hear a lot is they say like that we're, it's going to open the manufacturers up to massive liability. Their lawyers are very worried. That's lawyers job. It's their job to be worried. Uh, but it actually, uh, we find isn't uh, a substantial issue. I mean, we have this, this concept of personal responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> and so I realize that the U S we have a lot of lawsuits and litigation, but the courts are going to decide based on personal responsibility. If you're changing the tire in the car and you drop the car onto yourself, that's not the manufacturer's fault. That's your fault for being an idiot. Yeah. We've had right to repair for cars for a long time. Uh, and you'd think if there's anywhere where there'd be product liability from people repairing their own yeah. products, it would be, it would be with cars, <laughs> cars. Uh, not with electronics. Yeah. I, I had in one of these state negotiations, a representative from Apple uh, showed up and he said that same thing. He said, look, people are going to hurt themselves if, if we enable them to fix their own products. And I said, you know, the only people I've seen hurt themselves uh, with an iPhone with a cracked screen are people that are using it and cutting their <laughs> finger. <Yeah. laughs> I right? need to get a fix. So it's almost more of a danger using a product that's broken, not, not, not fixing it. Right. Or walking, you know, how many times have we seen people walking around with inflated or, you know, damaged batteries that are a fire hazard? Right. <laughs> Why is my screen pu like pu puffing out? Please, please go right. get that fixed. Yeah. I mean, how, I think all of last year, every flight I took, they said like, you cannot come on board with your Samsung device. You just like take it out of your bag and leave it because of the fire hazard it presents. Right. Mm, that's crazy. And when they're talking about farmers and modifications that, you know, people could be making to those tractors, did they always make it sound like we're like souping up these tractors to do like the Cal Poly tractor races or like <laughs> play taking the field? That's not what people are doing. And if, you know, modifications or if you do, you know, change your device or do something with it that's illegal, you can be held accountable for right. that. But that's not the reality. Right. That's not what's happening. And, and fortunately, the, the legislators are really used to, you know, spurious arguments. They yeah. understand. They and, and as long as they're hearing from constituents, as long as uh, as the people are regularly talking to them, uh, they're, they're, they're totally willing to listen. Yeah. Democracy really does work. Yeah. Uh, you can, we got, we got cell phone unlocking passed in Congress. This was a huge issue where AT&T, one of the largest companies in, in the U S uh, with, with an incredible army of lobbyists was saying, we don't want people to be able to move their cell phones from one carrier to the next. <laughs> and uh, we had people write in, we had 114,000 people sign a petition and Congress listened to us and, and they did something about it. And they overruled the big company. So just because it's a big company with lots of money doesn't mean that we can't beat them. But the only way that we're going to beat them is by being organized and persistent and vocal. Yeah. Let's see. I was looking to see what questions we had coming. Yeah, let, let's talk a little. Let me show you. So this is the so uh, uh, Susan Talamantes Eggman is the representative that's introduced the bill in the California House. Now we need to get a bill introduced in both the House and the Senate. So if you're if you're I mean in any state in the in the country. Um, uh, reach out to your elected representatives. Uh, we've put together this handy form and you can go to california.repair.org or you can actually just punch in any state that you want. Uh, Minnesota has a bill uh, and, uh, and, and you can, uh, it'll give you a little form to fill out. And one thing that I would encourage you, you can fill this out and you can write a letter. You can also punch in your phone number and your zip code. And then uh, we, are, we set up a, a server that will call you and then dial your representatives one at a time. So you don't have to figure out their phone number. You don't have to figure out who they are. Just punch in your phone number and your zip code. We'll call you only once, uh, and then connect you uh, through to your representative. So that's a really cool tool, and you can uh, you know you can punch that in if you live in New York. We have a we have a similar tool in New York. Just punch in your zip code and phone number, mm -hmm. and we'll connect you right through. And then this is also a form uh, that you can use for for writing your legislator. So I'll I'll fill this out uh, for me. This is the I fix the address, start writing, and then this is going to uh, my representatives are Jordan Cunningham and Bill Monning, and I've talked with both of them about it, and I can send them a letter. 
please customize the leather. The more information that you give them, if you can tell them a personal story, if you can tell them about why you care about it, that's great. Don't just hit send leather, fill in a little bit more information. It'll go a lot farther. And, you know, we've got, you know, numbers on iFixit, 100 million people, you know, come to the site every year to fix things. And I think that's one big part of this is showing, um, showing people that, hey, this, you know, my generation, people now are repairing things. This isn't just something that, you know, your grandpa talked about from back in the day, you know, going on and talking um, to legislators or just sharing photos saying, you know, with hashtag right to repair, showing people that we're actually doing this. Um, is a huge help. And one thing I think is amazing about right to repair is that this is a bipartisan bill. Um, repair um, impacts everybody's lives for all the right reasons. And it's definitely a time, I think, for both sides of you know people to come together because it is us against these right. manufacturers and these companies. Right. Yeah, we have we have Republicans in Nebraska and Kansas introducing right to repair. Uh, Representative Eggman is a Democrat from California. Uh, w w this is something that we really uh, have the ability to bring people from across the aisle. And, and even internationally, you know, if you're in Sweden or Argentina, the, the, the democratic process works very similarly mm -hmm. everywhere. And it's very possible for you, like find who your elected representative are. If you're running a business, ask them to come and, and take a tour of your business, show them around and then, and then talk to them about the problem. They're very, very eager to address, address the concerns of citizens. Uh, and, and there's so many issues that they hear from where people are just wacko. <laughs> if you can come to and, and that they can't do anything about. So if you come to them with something that's reasonable, that's actual, where they actually can, uh, can do something that's going to, uh, improve, yeah. improve citizens in their, in their district, they're going to be really excited. And I see some people asking about links um, in the description of the video. We've got all the links that Kyle's um, showing you here. So um, links how to reach out to your state legislators and everything are right there in the description. But uh, Matt, what were you going to say? I was going to say one of the, the surprising things about the, the right to repair movement has been the groundswell of grassroots. You know, right. The, the right. The repair.org board is limited in size and limited in capacity because the country is so big and what we want to do is so massive. But you see in states like Washington and, and, and other places as well, like some of these bills are being introduced just by community activism that's not really in, in a major coordinated effort by the Repair Association. It's just concerned citizens speaking out. So in a state like Arizona, where there is no right to repair bill um, right now, you can still go to Arizona.repair.org and you can write to your legislator and help get something introduced, as well as going ahead and scheduling those one-on-one -on -one meetings with your representative and saying, hey, this is really important to me. We should introduce something. And it happens. People introduce bills. Um, just like, like I said, it's like crazy. It just pops up out of nowhere. Oh, there's a bill being introduced today that we need to be on top of. Right. And even if your state hasn't, isn't one of the 18 so far, uh, reach out to a legislator anyway. It's not too late to get bills introduced. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they can drop in as a, as a placeholder. Uh, you got to get the conversation started. One thing that we have found is that legislators tend to be older uh, and and they don't have as much technology expertise. And so there's a fair amount of training and educating about what, why this is a challenge. Like why is right to repair matter now where it didn't before? And as electronics have moved into more and more products, it's given manufacturers more tools to lock consumers yeah. out. And you've had, did, have you worked with state legislators, like having them actually do repairs? I wish more people could just get <laughs> hands on with this stuff because people's technical identity makes them scared of these types of repairs. And so people that you know don't have experience in them are probably more likely to be like, oh no, this bill or this isn't, you know, isn't for me or it doesn't matter to me, but really right to repair does matter to you, even if you're not a fixer, because it impacts the private repair industry and the people that you would be going to, to get these. Um, right. Repair ones. Yeah. Matt and I have gone to conferences for these state legislators and we, and we fix phones with them and Matt, you want to talk about your experience <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean we you know it's a conference where you're just dealing with these legislators day in day out for you know two or three days straight and all we're doing is just hey let's take a look at your phone maybe we can help you out with something and they either have a phone that's a couple years old the battery doesn't last as long or uh they've got that crack screen they've been suffering through uh for the last couple of months and they're thinking about getting it fixed so we do that for them and they are blown away at how simple the process is, how quick it can be, um, how professional the experience is. And, and that's really a good takeaway for them that this wasn't something foreign. It was actually something very real that um, goes on daily in their, you know, in their district, wherever that may be, um, which was a point that, you know, when I was with uh, Robert Miranda in Nebraska at the right to repair hearing last year, um, we talked a lot about how this was local jobs that, you know, they needed to be aware of these weren't just, you know, we weren't sending jobs for the repair out of state or out of country. These were jobs in their district that they would be supporting by enacting this legislation. 
Right. And there's, uh, there's a, I mean, I think the time is now people are really frustrated about Apple's business with the batteries where they're slowing phones down intentionally. Uh, the, the lines at Apple stores are, are completely unreasonable. Yeah. I mean, Apple does That's not have enough retail employees like to do all the service that they need. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah well, we should, we should play a game. What yeah. would you, what would you uh, <laughs> prefer to go to last the Apple store or the DMV? Yeah. I avoid the Apple store like the plague. And I know, yeah, I know people have been going in who, you know, think that they're eligible, but then because they maybe, you know, took their phone into the bathroom with them while they're showering that, you know, the indicator light for water, you know, um, um, water damage goes off and they didn't, you know, weren't having any issues with their phone and Apple just kind of throws their hands up and doesn't want to help them out. Or if you have a third party screen, but an original battery, they don't want to help you out. So um, there's a lot of um, yeah, special very, situations. They are, they are frustratingly misleading with their, their policies too, right? So like we understand that they're not allowed to deny you warranty service on your battery because you had an aftermarket screen put on, you know, you had a screen repair done in an independent shop. Yet, their policies make that very, very unclear, right? They say that this is our policy. We don't allow that except where consumer protection laws may. And then you have to go and hunt down that law, which refers to another law. It's not very clear cut at all. And I think one of the things that the, the beauty of this legislation is that it's very simple. It's, I think, how many pages, Kyle? It's like one page, two pages long. Yeah, two pages max. Yeah, it's a very simple thing for everybody, whether you're a legislator or a repair shop owner or a consumer that might benefit from this. It's very simple to read and understand and get behind. Right. But the key is this isn't going to happen unless citizens get engaged. Yeah. It's easy to watch and be a lurker on the internet, uh, but this isn't going, this is not something that's going to happen if people are passive. But like you mentioned, it's now an issue for you know, every single iPhone user that, you know, is due for a battery replacement. People are now uh, more aware of how it's impacting them directly. And so when you're doing outreach, you know, within your own community and trying to get people motivated for this, also look to your makers and tinkers. It's not just the private repair industry or, you know, the few people that just, you know, have open devices all over their homes, like the avid tinkers and stuff, but makers and anybody that I just, you know, that wants to be able to open their um, electronics without fear of litigation um, should, you know, should be in favor of this. But now it's, it's expanded to even just the average iPhone user. I mean, everybody should know. Right. And th this is something, if you want to learn more about this, there's a lot of other YouTube channels that have been talking about this issue, not just us. Uh, check out Lewis Rossman and, mm -hmm. and Jessica Jones' uh, channel. They've they've talked about it, and they're showing in practice the kind of advanced repairs that you can do if we have access to this information. Mm -hmm. We've been fortunate that uh, the, the schematics for most iPhones have fallen off a truck somewhere in China and all the repair shops have them. <laughs> uh, we don't necessarily have that level of schematic for other types of products, and so you can imagine the economic opportunity that would happen if all of a sudden people would do more advanced repairs on Samsung phones or on mm -hmm. HTC phones. Uh, and I think that's something that's that's really been underreported about right to repair is the opportunity to create jobs. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing manufacturing jobs go to Asia. Uh, and okay, maybe maybe that's uh, something that we can we can try to reverse with with more tariffs. Maybe not. Uh, but what we can do is create more repair jobs and, and the repair jobs are going to be where the products are at. Because yeah, nobody likes, I mean, that's an issue now. Nobody wants to send their phone off to Apple to have that battery replaced. You don't want to send your phone. You want your stuff fixed, <laughs> you know, the day of or, you know, locally. So these jobs um, would be staying, right. staying here. Currently, 3% of American jobs are in the repair sector. Yeah, and and so it, it would be interesting to see what, what would happen if we could make that 5 or 6%. Like that would be a substantial number of jobs that you're talking about, 3 million jobs currently in the repair sector now. Uh, we could add potentially millions more jobs yeah. if we had the ability to repair more products. It's just crazy to think because it's phones. It's not, you know, we, we're getting a lot of coverage on phones and tractors because of batteries and, um, you know, The Verge has been covering uh, Nebraska farmers, but it's your, you know, refrigerator that has an LCD on it. And your, um, this is, you know, so many, This, if you think about all the appliances that have maybe unnecessary electronics, but electronics in them, um, repair, more repair people are needed for all, all of those things. Right. Matt, what other products are, we've been talking about cell phones a lot, but what do you think is is the most interesting uh, uh, kind of market opportunity that this is going to open up? Um, I mean, I think the idea of people being able to tinker, I mean, the, the uh, ability for people to expand on the designs, uh, you know, the devices that we get beyond just smartphones, uh, connected watches, you know, we're all about the internet of things now. So 
when the nest breaks, can we fix it? Are we able to get in there? It's simply, I mean, I installed a nest actually yesterday at my house and I was amazed at how simple it was relatively to, to get it installed and set up. It was, you know, standard Phillips screw heads and, uh, and it came with a screwdriver and they gave me very clear instructions on how to do it. There was no threat there about don't touch our property, hire a professional to do this or else. It was a very simple, clear cut process. And so I think like the more we get into these connected, smart things, we, and that they want to be a part of our lives, they have to grapple with reality that, you know, we're not always going to be in a position to hire that expert professional to come in from out of town uh, to help me install it. I'm going to want to do it myself. And I think the coolest thing will be seeing a better working relationship between the manufacturers and between the consumer where they're setting them up to be successful on using their own devices um, and really getting a better understanding of how they work, right? You don't just want to turn it on and have it work necessarily. You want to know all of the things you can customize it to make it your own. When I come home, will the lights turn on? Will the thermostat go up to the right temperature so that I'm not freezing cold in my house? Whatever it may be, those kinds of unique understandings of how your things work, I think, is a lot of where the passion for me comes in the right to repair movement is if I buy it, I should own it and I should be able to tinker with it and get to understand it in ways that maybe the manufacturer didn't even anticipate. Right. All right so just to recap, what are, what are some ways that people can get engaged? So on repair.org, we've got the easy um, call and email your state legislators, um, forms and things on there. But so punch in your state.repair.org, North Carolina.repair.org, Texas.repair.org, uh, California.repair.org. Definitely on there. And then if you, if, if they're hearing, where can they find um, upcoming hearings for right? Do they post get on the right? repair the other mailing list and then, and then we'll, we'll be in touch or, or the I fix it mailing list. And we'll be, we'll be sending people out. We don't know. Oftentimes, like we found out about the hearing, the hearing in Washington was on Tuesday. Yeah. We found out Friday. Yeah. Do they let a lot of people into those or is it? Uh, I mean, sweet it's, just it, to have it, this, it was like, standing crowd. room only at the Washington hearing, but they cool. didn't turn anybody away. So okay. it just depends on how many people want to show up in Sacramento. Cool. Uh, we can pack the house. It'd yeah. be fun. Uh, yeah. So, so the first thing to do is to find out who are your state legislators. Uh, we're focused state level, right? So you want to find who your elected representatives are. Um, I'll, uh, there are some, some websites that you can go to, like, mm -hmm. like here is one, um, I uh, just search for uh, how do I find my legislators and I punch in my address and that says here. So my state senator is Senator Monning and uh, my my rep in the, in the House of Representatives is Jordan Cunningham. And so I need to reach out to both of them. Neither of my reps are, are sponsoring the right to repair bill yet, but we want them to. And so what you want to do if you have a state that already has a bill, figure out the bill number and then call and ask them to sponsor. In the case of California, it's AB 2110 is, is the bill right now. So if you can give them the, the bill number, that's great. If, if they don't already have a, a bill in your state, like Texas doesn't have a bill yet, ask them to introduce it and point them to repair.org for the for the reference legislation. Um, that's that's the, the bare minimum. That's how you, you kind of get started. And then, you know, like if you can you know find an opportunity, if you can find an event uh, where they're yeah. going to be in your community and then show up and ask them a question or uh, get to know staff. If you're running a business, if you can get them to come to your business, that, that really has a huge impact. Or if there are local repair events going on, when we run our um, repair cafe um, locally, we invited um, just local state or just local reps, your mayor, you're just, um, well, I would a urge you to create, you know, um, get some people together to create your own repair cafe. And um, there are, you know, what am I thinking? Um, the different repair cafes, there's a few movements in the U S um, if you just search repair cafe in your area, one might pop up. And if not, you should definitely, um, try to get your community get together to run one of those because that's another part of this right. movement is the grassroots and getting people to actually you know fix things um, but then yeah inv inviting local reps in to watch everybody fix stuff and it just completely changes too. their perspective when they see yeah. people fixing things to realize oh we aren't just throwing everything away um, the other thing is is we're working on putting together a, a oh. letter of California businesses so I've got a form that's in the in the footer mm -hmm. and this is a sign up form that the uh, the California public interest research group is putting together and they want we're trying to build out a list uh, so we can get like 200 uh, uh, local businesses in California to sign on to this letter so don't sign on here if you're not in California um, but this is uh, something that then we'll be able to go and deliver 
we've been putting together these uh, you know letters of, of support. Another thing that we, you can do is actually you can get your city or your local community organizations to get on board and send a letter. So if you're a member of a Rotary Club that, that could get involved or or we've actually had uh, some cities in California decide that the city wants to support it. And so the, they can have either the city council pass a resolution supporting the legislation or they can send a letter. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to kind of get creative about like, just think about who do you know, who's connected, who can do this kind of thing. Have your business write a letter, have your community organizations write a letter. This, the, the key thing here is, is, is to be vocal. And so just think about what kinds of platforms that you have for being vocal. And we mentioned, we were talking about this the other day, how hard it is to actually <laughs> make, there's just so much going on in the news and so much happening that, um, but being vocal and really, um, especially, you know, through these talks and on social media, talking about this, um, to bring it some attention, um, just need more voices and more people. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, so some folks are talking in the questions about Louis Rossman. Louis Rossman has been hugely in favor of right to repair. I think he's going to be out in Albany, uh, in, uh, in a few days we're doing, a doing a legislative outreach day um, on, on um, I think, May 1st uh, up in Albany. So I've, I've uh, stayed in contact with Lewis and we're st still very excited about uh, getting something done. Uh, it's just, I mean, this is a multi-year process. We're a few years into it. Lewis was one of the first on board and we're really appreciative of all the, the outreach and advocacy that he's done. He's really helped us get a lot farther in New York than we would be right, right now without him. We've got yeah, and I think- Go ahead, Matt. I, I I think that what I've noticed too is that just in the last, I think, two or three years that I've been a part of this movement, um, just the the level of stories that rack up that support our argument that just come out over time, right? Like a year ago, we didn't have battery gate as, you know, right. ammunition in any type of hearing, right? But, you know, Kyle, you were tweeting on, you know, on Twitter, I was like, favorite of this because it's like one of my favorite things. It's like you said, let's conservatively say there's 250 million uh, iPhones out there, uh, or 25% that need a new battery, and it takes a genius 15 minutes, you did all the math, and it was like, it would take them two and a half years just to clear out the US backlog. And it was, you know, insane when you start to do the math and think of the scale of the problem and how, like we said in the beginning, ill equipped they are to handle this. Um, it just starts to make a lot more sense The pieces come together. And I think for legislators that that really starts to resonate with them. And talking about this like greater kind of waste issue, all these batteries that are going going to be dumped afterwards and that can't be recycled. Right. We've got, we're gonna, uh, I think the UN estimated this year was the year where globally we've passed um, 50 million metric tons of e-waste will be this year. And so, I, and, and I feel like as a consumer that the manufacturers kind of leave it up to us to figure out what happens to our device at the end of life, but they're the ones, you know, that kind of designed the battery to be stuck in there and this kind of thing. So I think Right to Repair also holds them accountable for the end of life of things. And right, that's one of the side effects. The bill would require they make repair information available. Well, that would actually give for the first time ever recyclers information on how to disassemble yeah. these products. So, you know, when you throw a laptop into the incinerator, it doesn't blow up on you because you know where the battery is. You know how to get right. it, get yeah. it out. It's, yeah, the recyclers so have to uh, remove batteries by hand before they go into the shredder. So this is something that would be hugely helpful. Recyclers have been begging for this information and manufacturers mm -hmm. have so far refused to provide them with any, any safe information on how to recycle their products. So that's something that I think would be a, a really significant benefit. And that's why you have groups like Californians Against Waste that are hugely in, in favor of, of this bill. We also have uh, uh, the post landfill folks and, mm -hmm. and Greenpeace and other organizations that, that like right to repair, which is, this is strange that we have, we've got folks like the Farm Bureau and the Corn Growers Association and Greenpeace agreeing on an issue. This is probably <laughs> the first time they've ever agreed <laughs> on something. It may be the last time, so we should take advantage while we got it. <laughs> yes. uh, any, any final words from you, Matt, before we wrap up? No, I, I think, you know, the biggest thing that uh, is really great to see is just more and more independent shops taking an interest and in becoming active, um, especially in their regions. I think we can't get to every state, we can't get to every hearing and have every meeting with the legislators. So I think the ground support, grassroots support is the most essential part of, uh, of this being successful. I completely agree. So we're, we're, we're working really hard, but we can't do this without all of you. Uh, uh, share, share the links uh, around with all of your friends and, and see if you can get people, keep people activated. This is, yeah. uh, this is something that we can do. I think it's something that we need to do, uh, but, but it won't happen without, without all of us kind of uh, putting our, putting our shoulder into it. Yeah. Showing the world that we're 
capable of fixing, well, not afraid to fix things, capable of fixing things in that, yeah, this is, um, we care about it, not only for our personal, you know, just device um, lifetime um, concerns, but also just as a global waste issue, uh, jobs issue. Um, it really touches down in a lot of the different um, spaces. So if you're in another country and you're wondering how to get going, or you want yeah. reference legislation, uh, fill out the contact form over on repair.org and you can get in touch with us uh, and, and let us know like wh where, where you're at, what you think the legislative strategy might be uh and and we can send over some some language we've got folks in europe that are actively working on this as well thanks everybody so much yeah. for your time this was a blast yeah no it was great yeah. thanks all awesome. bye matt thanks so much for, for being here yeah thanks <laughs> cheers bye